Good morning, everybody. Morning. There we go. That's better. Uh, super excited to have you all here. Um, this is the first time we're offering this new tutorial, so we're really excited about uh, about providing it to y'all. Um, there's more chairs coming, George. You can have the, you got this one right here, though. Someone's got to separate Gautam and Aza here. <laughs> um, so, so today we've got a full day tutorial set up for you, and the, and the intent of this tutorial is to give you a, a little bit of taste of a lot of the aspects of the Odyssey community. Um, what we are going to be doing throughout today is kind of walking through the full journey from data to evidence and giving you exposure to the OMOP common data model, processes for transforming and standardizing data, and then going through the whole process of phenotype development and evaluation, characterization, estimation, and prediction. Uh, and we're going to walk through each of those pieces, giving you uh, a, a little bit of a exposure to both the theory and the, the tools that are, exist in the Odyssey community. Uh, you are not going to come away from this tutorial proficient in all of these topics. Um, instead, what you're going to do is hopefully be intrigued by the topics, and each one of these 50-minute segments that you're going to get in this tutorial actually has a full-day tutorial behind it. Um, I think almost all of them available on the Eden Academy. Um, so rather than making you uh, have to um, uh, take the entire, what is now basically weeks-long uh, curriculum that's available on the Eden Academy, this is just going to give you a little bit of a taste of everything, and then you can go pick the areas that you're interested in. One reason that we're excited about this tutorial is we recognize in the community there's a lot of people who play different roles, uh, whether it be you're, you're in your organization and you're responsible for standardizing data or you're on the clinical side and you're responsible for the research. And we find it extremely valuable for everybody to have a big picture understanding of how all the pieces fit together, even if you're going to specialize in one area or the other. So um, we asked you even when you, feel, when you signed up for the tutorial to say, like, what are you familiar with? What are you expert in and what are you new at? With the expectation that everybody was going to say, I'm familiar with something, maybe, um, and I'm not expert in a lot of it. And that's very purposeful. We, what we're offering today is this tutorial is not something that we would expect anybody to be fully expert in all of the different components. And that's actually largely reflected by, um, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a nice silhouette too. You can move over one seat. <laughs> um, uh, what we're what we're actually anticipating, you're gonna you're gonna get uh, uh, some of our our uh, leaders in our community will be presenting each of these sections. But one of the things I want to like reinforce for you is like you're not expected to be an expert in all of these things. What I would encourage you instead to think about is how can you actually create a team that has collectively the set of skills and expertise to put so together. So in case anybody forgot from yesterday, I'm pretty big on this idea that we can come up with ways to build together appropriate solutions. And this is part of the, the start of that journey to, to make that happen. Um, so, uh, so welcome, first of all. So um, the other objective that we have for this tutorial is for you all to get to meet and have exposure to other people and you know, become part of our broader community. Um, so the, today's tutorial, you're going to get a chance to, to learn, but I also want you to be able to connect with folks. So just to get the ball rolling, I know we have a very diverse set of uh, folks in the room. Could I ask you to stand up if you're here from an academic institution? So there's our academics. OK, very good. And can you stand up if you are working in a pharmaceutical or a med tech company? All right, so we got some industry folks, too. Uh, if you work for a government agency. All right, we got a bunch of government folks. Uh, other. <laughs> All right, and we got we got a bunch of others too. So very good. All right, stand stand up if you consider yourself the data person. If you're on this journey from data to evidence, who's who's focused on data, data operations, ETL, that kind of work? Okay, we seem to have like a stratification that, that data people tend to like the back of the room a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> And who considers themselves more on the, uh, uh, more on the uh, statistics method side of things? So maybe epidemiology statistics side. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Okay. 
And who considers themselves more on the, like, the clinical research side? Do we have cl clinicians or clinical folks that are motivating questions? Jenny, given that you, you operate on patients, you can consider yourself. You don't have to be sheepish about it. You, you're definitely a clinician. <laughs> All right, so, so you can see in this room we have a lot of different diverse backgrounds and perspectives and expertise, and that's actually great. One of the things I want to challenge you with is I hope you learn from the content that we're putting, but I also want to challenge you to learn from the colleagues around you, learn from the folks that are at your table, network and, and, and meet folks, because really what we're trying to do in Odyssey is create this community and set of collaborations where you can meaningfully uh, uh, identify teams that you can work together to solve important problems. All right, um, so I'm gonna dive into our intro section here. I um, uh, wanna first thank, again, our colleagues at the FDA for providing us support for the symposium, which includes uh, funding that actually makes it possible for us to offer this tutorial, so I wanna thank them again. Uh, George and I will continue to, to uh, restate our mission at all the start, because this is really is what motivating what we're trying to do. Uh, Odyssey is trying to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. And this tutorial is gonna basically walk you through that entire journey from data to evidence. And, and, our, and our focus really is trying to get us all the way to the end of that journey, to actually have reliable evidence that actually has an impact in the lives of patients all around the world. Um, hopefully you all did get a copy of the, our journey book yesterday, and hopefully you can have it. You're gonna see lo uh, a lot of things we're gonna go through. We're gonna go through very fast, admittedly, during this tutorial, but pretty much everything that you're gonna see has some reference in the book to, so that you get the URLs to all of the, the materials. This tutorial is being recorded. This is gonna be posted on the Odyssey website, and ultimately, uh, um, uh, hopefully Nigel will be able to take this and actually turn it into an Eden Academy uh, course that will be available as well. So all the slides, everything that you're going to see, it's going to be posted probably tomorrow uh, on the website. Um, uh, and so if you are, you know, if you miss a URL or you're worried about something, it's all going to be available. But you can also just you know, uh, raise your hand, and let us know. So this journey from data to evidence, uh, uh, a common, uh, it's deliberate that we talk about this as a journey, and the, the reality is that in today's, uh, for most people right now, this journey is a meandering one. It is super hard to go from data to evidence. And particularly if we start talking all the way at the source data that we oftentimes talk about, and that process that we have to go through to standardize and normalize that data and get all the way to the point that we have evidence we consider to be reliable. When we talk about this journey, it's important to highlight that there is no just one, one size fits all when we talk about data. There are different types of observational data that you all may have familiarity and exposure to. That those can differ by various dimensions. We could talk about databases being different in terms of the populations that they represent. We have, uh, see, I don't see in the room, but within our community, we've got um, a network of uh, children's hospitals and we've got Medicare data. Uh, representing you know, both the pediatric and the elderly population. Um, our health equity work group is you know, focusing on um, uh, social determinants of health, uh, and we have populations and data sets that really you know, are and are not representative of various disparities. We have data sources that represent different care settings, whether they be hospital databases that are primarily focused on what happens from the time of admission to the time of discharge, uh, outpatient systems, We've got primary care, whether it be general practitioners or specialty databases. Um, and of course, we, we also have integrated systems that are bringing all of this information together. There are various data capture processes that we can think about, whether they'd be administrative claims data, electronic health record data, clinical registries. Um, and uh, uh, actually, I, I didn't ask folks to raise their hand, but uh, uh, could, could folks raise their hand if they are from not the United States? There we go. So we've got about a third of the room here from outside the U.S. And the health systems matter a lot. Uh, uh, and whether or not you're talking about an insured population or an uninsured population, or just the health policies and regulations that actually govern healthcare are dramatically different around the world. So today in this tutorial, you're going to get exposure to a U.S. administrative claims database. We want to thank our colleagues at IQVIA and specifically Mui Van Zant for providing us a sample of the IQVIA Pharmetrics database. This is a data set that can be licensed from IQVIA, um, and it represents inpatient and outpatient care for an insured population 
right? So people who have insurance, the administrative claims that are processed for that, that population. Um, so that, uh, if we think about that as a particular data source, that is going to uh, cover a population that's primarily up to the age of 65, because in the United States, uh, individuals after 65 uh, qualify for Medicare uh, and would, would get their insurance through there. So it's basically be an under 65 population. Um, it would, it's an insured population, so that means those that are of low, lower socioeconomic status who are not employed may not qualify to have private insurance. It's going to have both inpatient and outpatient care, basically anything that is reimbursed for the healthcare system. It'll have both primary and secondary care. Basically, as long as you're going to a doctor and the doctor wants to be paid, it'll be in the system. Um, and it is only administrative claims data. So the information that is actually processed for professional service claims, uh, out, outpatient and inpatient medical service claims, as well as retail pharmacy uh, claims. And it's, it's going to be you know, what happens here in the United States. You're going to get that experience, and I'm sharing about a little bit about this data because uh, Claire and Melanie are going to teach you about the data source and how to ETL that data source. But I want you to realize that what you're going to learn for Farmetrics only applies to Farmetrics. The principles that you're going to learn hopefully would be applied no matter what kind of data that you're working with. Another reason why this path from data to evidence is an, often a meandering one is because there is no one size fits all in terms of the type of evidence that's desired. So in the, uh, the framework that we have in Odyssey, we usually classify the types of evidence into three primary buckets. Clinical characterization, so when you are performing descriptive statistics. Population level effect estimation, where we're really focused on causal inference questions and patient level prediction, where we're, where we're you know, applying machine learning algorithms. For these, there are various different use cases that we have actually specifically been focused on in the Odyssey community to try to build standardized approaches to support. For clinical, uh, for clinical characterization, we see lots of members of our community using data to answer questions to support clinical trial feasibility. So can you, can you identify the patients who are gonna go into, go into research studies? We use the data for treatment utilization. You heard Peter Reinbeck talk about in Darwin EU, the EMA has a lot of interest in drug utilization studies. Um, and, uh, and actually, Marty's here. Marty presented one of the uh, uh, demonstrations at, at the showcase showing some of the ways that we can think about doing characterizations to support these types of questions. You can also think about disease natural history, just trying to understand a given disease, uh, to understand who are the people that develop that disease, what do they look like before they get the disease, how do they progress, and uh, how do they move forward. Uh, and uh, I don't see Ben in the room, but um, um, we also can think about how we can use these exact same tools for doing quality improvement. And particularly in the US, there's a lot of emphasis on trying to figure out what are the right things to provide good quality care, uh, and how can we identify what fraction of patients are receiving that good care. When we talk about population level effect estimation, there's a range of a host of different questions, all centered on causal inference, but this can both be for safety surveillance activities as well as for comparative effectiveness. So Martine talked a lot yesterday about the work that we're trying to do to improve the rigor of population level effect estimation. And today during the tutorial, uh, you're gonna get the experience of seeing both uh, a safety study and a comparative effectiveness study using the same design. And then when we talk about patient level prediction, we can think about use cases such as trying to support precision medicine or disease interception. And Jenna is going to uh, walk you through how we can actually uh, train, uh, develop, and, and evaluate uh, prediction models using the Odyssey framework for this. Each one of these types of evidence is a different type of study. If we were to grab a published observational research study out of the uh, of the literature, you would see this meandering journey from where did they get the data, how did they process the data, what kind of analysis do they do, and what results do they generate. And so this journey that we're gonna go through, there's a lot of different tools, and this tutorial specifically is gonna try to give you a little bit of exposure to all of the different paths that you could take on this journey. So the tutorial today, uh, you're gonna be, I'm gonna stop rambling in only a couple of minutes after I just in, uh, introduced the, the big picture idea, but, but really the experts in our community are gonna walk you through each of these pieces. Claire is gonna uh, present about the OMOP common data model and vocabulary and give you exposure to that. And Melanie's gonna walk through uh, the processes of ETLing. And so Claire and Melanie are gonna kind of tag theme this together to give you exposure to how to think through the Farmetrics data set and think more broadly about what this, how this would apply to any data set you might be working with. 
ASEA is going to um, uh, provide you support in thinking about how to create cohort definitions. And you're going to actually get hands-on exposure to use Atlas to think about the process of creating phenotypes. Um, from there, Gautham is going to present about phenotype evaluation. He's going to give you exposure to the cohort diagnostics tool. So they're going to be able to take the cohorts that ASEA shows you how to build and start to understand how do you actually think about whether or not those cohort definitions are, are appropriate, specifically in that Pharmetrics data set that you're going to get exposure to. From there, Kristen is going to actually provide you a tutorial on how to do characterization. And you're going to get exposure to some of the capabilities in Atlas um, uh, both, in, I, th I think you're going to at least see uh, uh, various tools that are available in Atlas and get to experience designing your own incidence analysis to understand how often uh, outcomes occur within a population of interest. From there, Martin's going to join us and he's going to give you a tutorial on estimation uh, and give you exposure to the cohort method uh, and how you exactly set, set up and run one of those studies. And then Jenna is going to uh, provide you a tutorial on prediction where we're going to be taking those cohorts and actually try to train a model. And then George is going to just kind of recap the day, uh, answer any questions that you've got, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, send, send you on your way for thinking about where you go next now that you've gotten some of this initial education. So I, I want to summarize more broadly you know, how we think about collaborations with an explicit invitation that I hope to encourage you all to, to join us um, in these various collaborations. Within Odyssey, um, it's not possible that any one person or any one group can do all of the things that you're going to learn about today. And, and so instead, we really do need people that are, dedicate their, their time and volunteer effort in our community into specific groups. So there are collaborations in open community data standards. Claire is the lead of our CDM work group. And so if you are a data person and after learning about this, you're thinking like, I wanna really help more on the data side, there's a place for you here in the community. We have active collaborations in open source development. You heard about all of the Hades packages that are developed. And if, if you're a tech person, you're thinking, yeah, you know what, I'd like to contribute to the code, whether it be writing a new package or maybe just testing and documenting the current packages. We actually have a Hades hackathon going on, maybe this room over here. Um, uh, and so we've got like 50 people that are hacking code right now. And if that's, if that's you, there's a place for you here in the community. Um, and for example, Gautam is maintaining multiple of the uh, uh, Hades packages. And so if, you, if you're thinking, how can I get involved? That, well, there's a place for you here to, to join us. Um, if you're interested in methodologic research, you, know, you saw some of the work that Martine was presenting. And certainly it's where Martine and I spend a lot of our time is thinking about how do we develop best practices that we should all follow. Um, we've got active work groups, both in estimation and prediction, that you can uh, come join us and participate and conduct studies. Um, so we encourage you that. Um, and we also have collaborations in clinical evidence generation. So if you have specific questions, if you want to be like, like Jenny and holding up a Titan Award uh, at a future Odyssey Symposium, come with a good clinical question and help lead an Odyssey Network study. And you don't need to be an expert in everything to pull that off. What we need is a really good question and somebody with the passion and drive to just drive that, drive that forward. And you'll find that there's a whole lot of people in the community uh, ready to get behind you and supporting you to conduct a network study um, as long as you've got a good question and you're willing to, to, to persevere through that process. Also, uh, about uh, uh, a whole bunch of you stood up to say that you're, you're data people and may exist in or may belong to organizations that have access to data. I want to encourage you to think about being a node in the Odyssey data network. What does that actually mean? That means in your organization, securely behind your own firewall, you can standardize your data to the OMOP common data model. You can install all the Odyssey tools. And when there are network studies, you can agree to participate. Uh, this is a volunteer effort. As George mentioned, you know, we've got 450 databases that are converted to the OMOP common data model. But we've only had, like our biggest network studies only had like 27 data partners that have participated. Only, only 27. It happens to be the world's largest study, but it could be way bigger. Um, but this is just a matter of, of, of you all participating and saying, you know what, I'd, I'd like to participate. I'd like my data to be part of the evidence to participate. And so it's an open invitation for anybody to participate in all Odyssey uh, network studies. And really it just takes, takes you all to say, say like, I'd like to be a node. And when somebody says, hey, will anybody participate in my study? It's just a matter of you raising your hand and saying, let, let me participate, which is as easy as on our Odyssey forums. When someone says, does anyone want to do a study? You just say, I'm in. 
Uh, and you'll see, uh, I think I saw Thomas earlier, like Thomas Falconer is, is on our team at Columbia. And you'll always see, uh, he's always raising his hand and saying, I'm, I'm ready to be part of the study. And we'd love to see more people be doing that. And then to do Odyssey Network Studies, basically this means somebody's got a really good question, they're gonna write a protocol, they're gonna specify their analysis, and they're gonna pro provide a package that can be shared with data partners. Anybody is invited and encouraged to create an Odyssey Network uh, Study to get sites to run, and then collaboratively we interpret that evidence and, and, and try to disseminate it. So I wanna encourage all of you, if you're thinking, geez, you know, Odyssey is really big and it's too much for me, anybody can participate in any one of these boxes. You do not need to be an expert in all of the boxes to just do one. In fact, quite, quite the contrary, what we're trying to build as a community is lots of folks who can be experts in one Lego brick so that we can put all the Lego bricks together to do something pretty spectacular. All right. So Claire's gonna go through the OMOP common data model. You'll, you've seen this picture, you'll see it again some more. Hades, these are gonna be the open source tools. You're gonna to get exposure to a whole lot of them within our community. Just wanna uh, 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 recognize that these are packages that you can download in R, the R Studio environment. You'll be able to get to that and you'll get some exposure to them throughout the day. What I'm gonna do now, just in the last five minutes, is introduce the clinical problem that we're gonna use as the common thread throughout today. You do not need to be a clinical expert or to even necessarily care about the story I'm about to tell you, but what we've very deliberately tried to do was just give you one context for the entire day just so you can orient yourself. So we, uh, you heard yesterday from, from our time talking about legend hypertension, and we are gonna take one specific question or one specific uh, drug, com drug combination out of the legend hypertension study to talk about. And that's going to be to examine the, the differences between lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide. What I'm showing you here is the product label for lisinopril. Lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. That's a class of drugs that is used to treat uh, hypertension. Um, this is the top of the product label. Zestrel is the brand name of lisinopril, but lisinopril is the active ingredient of which this is the most commonly prescribed first line treatment for hypertension, um, at least in the, in the US and many of the countries that we've looked at. Specifically, the indications for uh, lisinopril, it says here, AAS inhibitors, is for the treatment of hypertension in adults and pediatric, uh, pediatric patients six years and older. It's also an adjunct therapy for heart failure and a treatment for acute myocardial infarction. So hypertension is high blood pressure. You wanna manage your high blood pressure because otherwise bad cardiovascular events can happen such as heart attacks and strokes. And so uh, there are a wide range of hypertension treatments that are available. Um, ACE inhibitors is one of the common uh, classes. Hydrochlorothiazide uh, is another drug that is specifically a diuretic. It's just another uh, class of drugs that also treats hypertension. There are a range of other drugs, and I sent you all as homework uh, to read Mark Souchard's publication, and I'll just uh, highlight a couple of the things that are in that paper. The main thing to, to know is it's a drug to treat hypertension. The reason you would want to treat hypertension is because you don't want to have bad cardiovascular events such as heart attacks. Okay. Uh, th these drugs are quite effective at managing hypertension, and as George has published and, and others in our community, there's just open questions about how do we optimize treatment for hypertension because there's so many different treatment options. It would be nice if we could actually know which treatment would be right for which patient. In the case of lisinopril, um, there is a very distinctive adverse event that's associated with it, which is called angioedema. So angioedema is basically extremely severe swelling. It often occurs in the face, in the lips, in the tongue. Um, and uh, ACE inhibitors, and lisinopril uh, as, as, as an example of that, is known to have an uh, increased risk associated with angioedema. Now, Oftentimes, angioedema could create some swelling, and if you were to stop taking the drug, you'd get better. But some of these cases of angioedema can be quite bad to the point that if, you're, if your uh, throat were to swell up, you'd actually have problems breathing, and there have been very rare cases of, of, of death associated with angioedema. Um, so this is a serious adverse event that we really wouldn't want to have happen. Um, however, patients have to balance the fact that they really want to manage their hypertension because they don't want to have a heart attack or stroke but there is some risk 
that by taking this drug, they're going to have this adverse event of angioedema. Because, because lisinopril and ACE inhibitors are known to have this effect, the product label actually tries to provide a decent amount of detail about what this kind of effect would look like and to try to warn patients to be aware of it. But what you won't really find in the product label are questions or answers to questions such as, how often does angioedema actually happen amongst patients who take lisinopril? How much is the increased risk of angioedema for lisinopril relative to the alternative treatments, such as hydrochlorothiazide? Or if I'm a person who's taking uh, 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 lisinopril, given my baseline characteristics, what's the probability that I'm gonna experience an angioedema in the next year? And what I just described for you are opportunities to do a characterization study to estimate the incidence of angioedema, to do an estimation study to estimate the relative risk of angioedema amongst lisinopril versus other drugs, and to conduct a patient-level prediction uh, study to be able to predict who's gonna go on to experience the angioedema. So in, in um, the homework I gave you, um, we, we uh, in a gratuitous self-citation, we sent you one of the legend papers that was led by Mark Suchart, and this paper was published in Lancet a couple years back. And in this paper, we summarized the comparative safety and effectiveness of all of the first-line antihypertensive drug classes. What I'll just highlight for you are two of the figures just to kind of motivate and situate the problems that we're gonna be focused on. There's this figure one, and I'm gonna just highlight this top left bar. When you see ACE, you can think lisinopril. Lisinopril is the active ingredient that's one of the ACE inhibitors. It happens to be the most common ingredient in that class. And when you see THZ, that's thiazide diuretic. Hydrochlorothiazide is the drug, is the most common of the two uh, primary thiazide diuretics that are out there. So if you just want to think in abbreviations, ACE is lisinopril, TZ, uh, THZ is hydrochlorothiazide. And what you can see here is we, are, we have estimated the relative risk of um, uh, cardiovascular, uh, so up here, these top three are myocardial infarction, hospitalization for heart failure and stroke, and then we've got secondary cardiovascular events. If you look at this uh, relative risk here, um, basically one, uh, the hazard ratio of one would be to say that there is no difference between the treatments. Uh, and a, uh, a relative risk in this particular context, less than one would suggest that thiazide diuretics have a decreased risk of the event relative to ACE inhibitors. And anything that's over a one would suggest that ACE inhibitors, um, that, that thiazide diuretics have an increased risk. So what we showed in this particular paper is that for many cardiovascular events, ACE inhibitors, or thiazide diuretics, have a decreased risk of the cardiovascular events. And so that's simply to say, if we were to think about comparative effectiveness, if all else were being equal, and it's really hard for everything else to be being equal, then you might want to choose the product that uh, was going to uh, reduce your cardiovascular risk more. So just as context, we're going to be looking at lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, and one of the outcomes we'd want to pay attention to is how often does myocardial infarction happen? And so that's, in, that, in this study, that was that estimate where we actually saw this effect. The other thing that was in uh, Mark's paper um, was a complete breakdown of all of the various adverse events um, uh, we see here. And in this particular case, um, I'm gonna showcase specifically, I'm gonna go all the way down here to the one that's sticking out to the left here. When comparing thiazide diuretics to ACE inhibitors, what we saw is angioedema has a, has a substantial decreased risk relative to thiazide diuretics. Or to flip it over, there's an increased risk associated with lisinopril relative to hydrochlorothiazide for angioedema. So this is a side effect. So the first thing that I framed up, you could consider a comparative effectiveness study. The second thing I could frame up, you could consider this a safety surveillance study. It is really just two sides of the same coin here in that we are gonna do population level effect estimation to be able to try to quantify this risk. Oops. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm right at time. Let me just uh, stop and ask, does anybody have any questions about the clinical context of what we're gonna look at? We're gonna be studying lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, we're gonna be looking at myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, we're gonna be looking at angioedema, which is this rare 
rare uh, swelling side effect. And throughout the tutorials, that's kind of what you're going to be seeing as the building blocks that we're going to be generating evidence. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right. If not, I'm just going to end with one last thing. And I think, and I want to thank um, James Wiggins and uh, our, our friends at AWS who have generously provided us compute resource to make today's tutorial possible. Um, I, I suggest this before that if you hadn't gotten this URL, you might want to just take a picture of this now and hopefully you can all see it pretty well. Throughout today, you're going to get an opportunity to experience using Odyssey tools. You are not obligated to do any of this, but it's set up for you, so you might as well have some fun with it. Um, the, the tools that you're gonna ha you have ac access to anyway, you're gonna get to play with Atlas. And I'm, I know certainly during Asia's lecture and uh, Kristen's work, you're gonna get to play with Atlas. Um, and so you just go to that URL, tutorial5.useast1, elasticbeanstock.com. That will basically just open up Atlas in your browser. Uh, recommend you use Chrome as, if you've got it, but it'll just open up as an uh, Atlas browser and you're, you'll be in there and you'll be able to play with Atlas. Uh, James has also set up in this ecosystem uh, a Jupyter um, uh, place for you to be able to, we're not gonna use that in any of our classes, but for you to get experience if, if you guys are, are, are folks that like to work in Jupyter, you can see what it would be like to have access to all the tools. And then our studio, is set up in case you wanted to actually like run in our package. And Martine and Jenna um, will at least give you exposure to what it would look like to run the package. The other thing that you are going to um, get to experience is playing with some of the shiny apps that disseminate results. But I'll let each of the faculty members pull up the URLs for their specific um, tutorials when they get to that point. All right, so with that, any questions? Who's excited? All right. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Claire to get you started on your journey. <laughs>